We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So um, I want to start this story actually in the 1800s. So that in 1800, um, a young physician named Etard decided to take the, on the task of teaching a young boy French. Turns out that this young boy, they think, was between 10 and 12 years old. Um, he had no language, and he'd been discovered running around in the, in the woods naked um, and unable to communicate. Itard thought that this was a very important task because he thought that civilization was based on the ability to empathize and also on language. So he tried valiantly for two years to teach this young boy named Victor. He named him Victor because over this two-year time span, the only language that or sounds that this young boy could make was the French er, which sounds like Victor, hence he had his name. But after two years, Victor was unable to um, speak any French and comprehended very little French and primarily communicated with objects. And then Itard wrote this up after two years. He wrote up his uh, findings and he said that he thought that a major reason why Victor didn't learn French was because he was simply too old. But of course, this was the 1800s and he didn't speculate as to what it was about being 10 years old with no language that would prevent you from learning language if you had a daily tutor trying to teach you French. There's an enormous amount of irony in this particular story because Etard was the house physician for the first school for the deaf in the entire world. And here we have a picture of it. The first school for the deaf was begun in 1760 in Paris. And at the time that Etard was teaching um, Victor, he was at the school with all of these children who use sign language and all of these teachers who use sign language. Nonetheless, it never occurred to him to try to teach Victor sign language. But um, we can't blame him because in the 1800s, sign language was not considered to be a language. And in fact, that particular discovery and realization wouldn't happen for another century and a half. And so um, we can imagine why he didn't teach uh, Victor sign language. But the question is, could Victor have actually learned sign language if Etard had tried to teach it to him? Um, and so I'm going to try to answer that question today through a series of studies. But before I talk about our studies, I want to talk about something that all of the speakers who have preceded me have talked about, which is that one thing that's a, the defining characteristic of language is that it's highly structured. And it's highly structured at all of these multiple levels, so that speech sounds make up words, words make up, with their, make up words and phonemes, um, and these words are strung together in sentences with syntax, 
And this specific syntax helps us understand and produce very specific kinds of meanings. Now, and one aspect of, of uh, this language structure is that humans have evolved to the point where children learn this structure naturally. Nobody has to teach them. Nobody has to have a tutor to sit with them for two years to teach them the structure of French or the structure of English or the structure of ASL. Simply by being around people who use a language, young children naturally acquire all of this multi-leveled and complicated structure. That is to say, all children do this if, in fact, they can access the language around them. If they have normal hearing, they're born with normal hearing, they hear people talk, and before you know it, they're talking themselves. But if children are born profoundly deaf, they cannot hear the speech around them. And we know that lip reading is insufficient to learn language because most of the speech sounds are invisible. What happens to these children? If there's no sign language in the environment, they can't learn a visual form of language either. So it happens that there are large numbers of children who actually are like Victor in the sense that they grow up without language, without learning a language, but they are like Victor, they are unlike Victor in that they were running around in the woods nude and uh, having a very harsh life. So how does the lack of language in childhood affect the ability to learn language, or does it affect the ability to learn language? And this has been the focus of uh, studies that we have been doing um, for many years in our laboratory. Because we're using deaf children and sign language as a means to model language acquisition and its effect on the brain, I think it's appropriate that um, I talk a little bit about the kinds of stimuli we do and about American Sign Language. So, First of all, you should know that American Sign Language, unlike many of the sign languages that have been discussed up to this point, is a very sophisticated language. It's evolved clearly over 200 years. We might even say that American Sign Language evolved with um, the development of the United States of America and spread as uh, civilization went across, as white man went across um, the continent. So the uh, American Sign Language has a phonological system, a morphological system, syntax, um, and so forth. So for those of you who don't know sign, I know there are many people here who do know sign, I want to show you what some of this structure looks like. So I'm going to play you two videotapes. And for those of you who don't know sign, I would like you to guess which one is syntactically structured. And for those of you who do know sign, Maybe you could keep the answer to yourselves. <laughs> That's one. Here's two. So how many think two? How many think one? OK. For those of you who think two, I've captioned this. So this is really. Com, dirt, boom, blip, mackers, <laughs> graham cakes. <laughs> number, um, number one is a fully formed sentence with a subordinate clause. The reason I'm showing you these two sentences is, for those of you who don't know the language, you can't perceive or parse this particular structure. This is what knowing a language is about. For those of you who know ASL and who know this language, you know that the second example had all of these signs, which were non-signs, possible signs, but really just uh, non-signs. This is part of what knowing language is about. How do people learn this particular structure? And the question that we're interested in is, how does being a young child help people learn this particular structure? So, we did a series of experiments. Um, when we started this work, it wasn't even clear that age would make a difference in sign language acquisition. Sign language is gestural. Sign language is mimetic. Maybe anybody can learn sign language at any time in their lives. So in one experiment, what we did is we recruited a number of people. This is in Canada. Who, used, who were born deaf and who used ASL. And we asked them, we created an experiment where we had a set of um, sentences that varied in complexity, and we showed them these ASL sentences, and we asked them simply to point to a picture that reflected the meaning of the sentence that they saw. And here, and we were quite struck by the, our findings. What you see here is that deaf people who learned ASL from birth from their parents performed very, very well on this task. 
in contrast to deaf people who were adults who had been signing for over 20 years performed at chance. So they had great difficulty understanding some of these basic sentences in ASL. So this suggests that there are age of acquisition effects for sign as there are for spoken language. Everybody sort of the, the word on the street is it's much harder to learn a language if you're an adult than you're a child. But what if it's something deeper than this? What if there's something about learning a language in childhood that sets up the ability to learn language, that creates the ability to learn language? And so we did another experiment, also in Canada, but we decided to, in order to test this particular hypothesis, we should switch languages. So we're no longer testing a, um, ASL here. What we're testing here is English. We devised an experiment in English where we had a set of sentences and some of them were ungrammatical and some of them were um, grammatical. This is a common kind of task that psycholinguists use. And notice here that the people who were born profoundly deaf and for whom ASL was a first language are near native in English. So this is a second language. So learning a language early, even though it's in sign, helps people learn a second language. And notice also that they performed, their performance was indistinguishable from normally hearing people who had learned other languages at birth, German, Urdu, Spanish, and French. So that there's, it seems to be that there's something about learning a language early in life, regardless of whether it's a sign language or a spoken language, that actually helps people learn more language. It's not simply learning language when one is little. But as also part of this experiment, we tested a group of individuals who'd been signing for 20 years and had gone through the educational system in Canada who were born deaf. And on this task, they performed at chance. On a grammaticality judgment task, it's either yes or no, so it's at chance. So we see that individuals who are deprived of language, who aren't able to learn language at a young age, perform poorly on the, their primary language, sign language, and they perform very poorly on a second language, which is ASL, and we see the reverse. So there's something really special going on here about learning language at an early age. And what might this be? And might it be in the brain? So in a sec another set of studies, what we did is um, take these, this population that we have been looking at, and we decided to neuroimage their language processing to see whether this might give us some clues as to differences between first and second language learners and people who had language and people who did not have language. So in this study, also done at Canada, in Canada with colleagues at the Montreal Neurological Institute, we did MRI or fMRI, um, and maybe many of you have had MRIs, and um, we showed the subjects sentences like the sentences that you saw, and we asked them to make grammatical judgment, um, judgments on these sentences. And we tested 22 people. They were all born profoundly deaf. They all used American Sign Language as a primary language. They had all gone through the educational system, but they ranged in the age at which they were first able to acquire language. This is all the way from birth up to age 14. So if the age at which you learn your first language doesn't make a difference, then we should expect the neural processing patterns of all of these individuals to be similar. If age of acquisition makes a difference, we should see different patterns in the brain. And in fact, this is what we have, this is what we found. Um, when we did the analysis, we found that there were seven regions in the brain, primarily in the left hemisphere. Um, and as you know now, the left hemisphere has um, areas that are responsible for language. And one effect that we found was that in the language regions of the left hemisphere, the earlier the person learned their first language, the more activation we saw in the language hemisphere. However, the older the person was, when they learned their first language, the less activation we got in the, the language areas of the brain. So if there's less activation, is there something else going on here? And we actually found a second effect, which we were not expecting at all, which is in the um, back part of the brain, the posterior part of the brain, and visual processing, which is, and this particular effect was that the old, the longer the person matured, the older the, um, without language, the older they were when they learned language, we found greater activation, more neural resources being uh, uh, devoted to visual processing. So we see that here in this group of deaf signers, we have two complementary reciprocal effects of when a child learns his or her, when an individual learns their first language, and what the brain seems to be doing in terms of processing that language. 
so that for people who learned language early in life, almost all of their neural resources are devoted to processing the meaning and structure of that language. For people who learn their first language later in life, more neural resources are devoted to just trying, perhaps, to figure out what the signal was. Was it this a word? Was it glom? Or was it gleam? Um, and uh, so we have this reciprocal relationship between perceptual processing and language processing. This particular pattern is not unique to deaf signers. There's work by Tim Brown and um, uh, Schlegger that show that younger children often have more posterior activation than older children. And there are also some clinical populations, such as autistic individuals, particularly those who have low, whose language skills are not well developed, will often show more processing in the occipital lobe. So this is not a pattern that is unique to deafness. So then the next question we had is whether, in fact, is how does language develop when an individual first starts to learn it when they're much older, for example, when they are a teen? And we have been um, very fortunate to have followed five or six children um, in our laboratory who had no language until they were 13 to 14 years of age for a variety of reasons. Um, two of these children are from the United States. Um, these other children are from other countries. Um, and actually, this particular circumstance, while we might think of it as being very rare, is actually very common, and particularly in underdeveloped countries. Um, and so the way in which we have observed or analyzed language acquisition is to use uh, normal procedures that people use to study children's language acquisition. We get a lot of spontaneous data from them, and we analyze it. And so the one question we had is, if you're 13 years old and you don't have a language system, Will you develop language like a baby, or will you do something else? Because you have a developed cognitive system where you jump in the middle of the task, um, and how will this progress? To answer this question, we need to look a little bit at how um, we, um, normally hearing children, or uh, deaf or hearing children, develop language when they are, are exposed to it as a young age. The major hallmark, children's language acquisition, is that they very quickly as they are acquiring the grammar of their language, their sentences get longer and longer. And the reasons their sentences get longer and longer is because they're learning all of these, uh, uh, the morphology, the syntax, and as they say ideas, they're, uh, they, as they're expressing their ideas, they're better able to um, uh, use grammar to express them. And so these data show the average length of children's expressions. Two of these children are normally hearing and acquiring English, and um, two of these children are acquiring ASL. So um, we see that, in fact, the teens that we have been following show no increase in their language. They're able to learn language and put words together. But in fact, we don't see an increase in their grammar. In the last study, we wanted to neuroimage these children. We wanted to see what are their brains doing with um, the language that they have. And so we used a magno, we used MEG, magnetoencephalography, which is a different technique, which is complementary to the fMRI. And uh, what we did for this is we studied their vocabulary, and we made stimuli that we knew that they knew, the words that were in their vocabulary. And it looks something like this. In, in the first instance, the picture matched the sign. In the second instance, it didn't. And when that happens, the brain goes, uh-oh, and you get this uh, N400 response. And that's what we we're localizing in the brain for these children. And because we're using vocabulary that, um, that they have, we know that they knew these words. We asked them to press buttons and while they were doing this task, and we knew that they were accurate. We didn't only test these children. We also tested control groups. And so some of these control groups are deaf, some are hearing, some are first language learners, and some are second language learners. The first panel shows the response of a group of normally hearing adults doing this task while looking at pictures and listening to words. And this is data um, that, from, that Katie Travis used also to look at uh, young children's development, um, neuro, neural development. The second panel. These are deaf adults who learned ASL from birth. And you can see that their processing is very much like the um, hearing adults who are speaking English, um, primarily left hemisphere in the language areas with some support or help from the right hemisphere. And actually, these patterns are indistinguishable. Both the hearing adults and the deaf adults learned language from birth, even though it was in a different form. What's this last panel? 
These are college students, they're normally hearing. Uh, they have been learning sign for about three years, which is about the same amount of time that our cases were learning language. So that we see that, for, that um, responding on this task in, in speech and in ASL, whether it's a first language or a second language, so long as the subject had language from birth, looks fairly similar. What about the cases? We were able to neuroimage two cases. And you can see that their neural processing patterns are quite different. Um, and they look neither like second language learners, nor do they look like deaf adults. Um, these children have been signing for um, three years. Um, and they had no language before they started to learn how to sign. You can see primarily that there's a, a huge response in the right hemisphere in the occipital and parietal areas. One of the subjects also shows some, some response in the language areas. But we can see that even though they're acquiring language, they're doing it in a very different way, and their brains are responding very differently. So we see that, in fact, that there are huge effects of language environment on both the development of language, but also how the brain processes language. So we see that it seems to be that the human language capacity, both understanding language and expressing language, but also the brain's ability to process language is very dependent upon the baby's brain being exposed to or immersed in language from birth. And it's through this um, analyzing language and, and working on the data that it's being fed that, in fact, I think that the neural networks of language are being uh, created. So language is a skill that is not innate, but emerges from the interaction of the child with the environment through linguistic communication. And that was probably the answer that Etard was looking for and might be the reason why Victor did not acquire language. Thank you.